in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, we thank you for your kindness and magnanimity. Help us to appreciate the call you bestow on us to save you and our neighbor. May we come to appreciate that discipleship is more than a claim, but to respond to your will. May the call you extend to us instill in each and every of us that agency to save you and our neighbor. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in our catechesis today, we wish to reflect on the parable of the two sons, Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 to 32. The parable of the two sons declares what came to pass with respect to both Gentiles and the Jews. The former, notwithstanding the privilege of being hearers of the law. However, they showed forth the obedience in their works. The latter, on the contrary, after having said all that the Lord has spoken, we shall do and will hearken. Exodus chapter 19, verses 8. Unfortunately, were disobedient in their works. But dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it is one thing to speak about what you intend on doing with your faith, but it's another thing to actually follow God's call and act. In this parable, Jesus raises a simple yet profound point. Actively following God takes more of an effort than just claiming to follow him. It is not the tongue in our mouth that tells the most truth about ourselves, but it is the tongue in our shoes. As the adage goes, walk the talk. And dear brothers and sisters in Christ, our pericope hence depicts an illustration of divided response to Jesus and John. An illustration of the first, the chief priests and elders becoming last, and the last, namely, tax collectors and prostitutes becoming first. And indeed, the characterization of Jesus' opponents as hypocrites. In this parable, Jesus distinguishes those who generally knew the way of God from those who did not. The Jews initially appeared righteous having the revelation of God and the ordinances of justice established among them. The Gentiles were initially ignorant of righteousness, the way of God, and were sinful in their conduct. From the foregoing, we are able to deduce that those who feel they are knowledgeable and need nothing more, fail to realize their spiritual bankruptcy and see no need to change. They may appear righteous, but they deceive themselves. They believe their own righteousness who save them. And because they see no sin in their life, they see no reason to repent. And dear brothers and sisters in Christ, 
The parable of the two sons is found only in the Gospel of Matthew. It relates to one of the last encounters Jesus had with the Jewish leaders. The story of Jesus' initial encounter with the most powerful leaders follows soon after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and his cleansing and occupation of the temple. Matthew chapter 21 begins with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem as the long-awaited Messiah. The crowds respond by shouting Hosanna and praises to the king. And the king's first act upon entering Jerusalem was to cleanse the temple. He drove away all money changers and those buying and selling in the present of the temple. The idea of money changers and sellers of animals surely started innocently enough. The Torah prescribed that Temple offerings be free of blemish. Exodus chapter, 15, chapter 12, verse 5, and chapter 21, verse 9. Bringing an animal from afar would be impractical because the animal might be injured along the way, and thus rendered unsuitable for sacrifice. Therefore, people coming from afar needed a place to exchange money and to purchase suitable offering. Having those services available at the temple met a genuine human need, but those services evolved into profitable concessions and then into substantial businesses. The temple became less a place for profits and more a place for the temple became less a place for profits and more a place for business. Some religious leaders surely had reservations about the hustle and bustle in the temple, but it seemed necessary. However, Jesus did not try to engage the money changers in a debate, nor did he ask for approval before acting. He just walked into the temple and began spilling money on the floor, saying, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Immediately after, we see Jesus kissing a fig tree, Matthew 21, verses 18 to 22. By this act, Jesus was making a strong symbolic statement. The fig tree is often symbolic of Israel. Hosea chapter 9, verse 10, Joel chapter 1, verse 7. The fact that the fig tree had leaves, but no fruit, is symbolic of Israel's religious activity, namely, they had all the trappings of spirituality, but without substance. Israel may have had leaves of activity, but not the fruit of repentance and obedience to God, which is why Jesus tells them that the prostitutes and tax collectors who enter the kingdom of heaven already are ahead of them. As the second day of Jesus' occupation begins, the various groups opposing Jesus inaugurate a series of challenges, all of which aim at undermining his authority in order to dislodge him 
from the table. These challenges are zero sum, contests in which the winner gains honor and power at the loser's expense. If Jesus were to lose any of these challenges, his occupation of the temple would cease. His challenge to the authorities in Jerusalem would end, and the leaders would regain control of the temple. If they win any of these challenges, there would be no need to crucify Jesus. In these challenges, his adversaries were the chief priests and the elders of the people. The, the priest leaders in Jerusalem ruled at Rome's pleasure. Both the chief priests and the elders were where the elites who controlled large parcels of land in Judea and beyond, making them virtually identical with the rich and the powerful land owners. The religious authorities, the chief priests and elders, question Jesus' authority. Who is this Jesus who comes into Jerusalem and receives the praises of the masses and drives the money changers out of the temple? And this sets the stage for showdown. The challenge posed by the chief priests and elders focused on two closely related yet distinct questions. The nature of Jesus' authority and the source of his authority to cleanse and occupy the temple. Because Jesus was currently occupying the temple, he had an upper hand and he could give conditions for his reply. Before he could answer them, they must tell him about John's baptism. Was it from heaven or merely a human? The question of John's authority is essentially the same as the question of his own authority. After all, it was John who prepared the world for Jesus. Thus, those who acknowledge the divine origin of John's authority will likewise acknowledge the divine origin of Jesus' authority. While those who fail to identify the authority of John will fail to identify the authority of Jesus. This question puts them in a quagmire. They knew that a denial of the legitimacy of John's baptism would not go well with the crowds whose support they needed. On the other hand, if they affirm that John's baptism came from heaven, Jesus would ask them, but why did they not submit themselves to it? Hence, they feigned ignorance. We do not know. Thus, what began as an attack on Jesus quickly turned into an exercise in damage control. And with this exchange, the challenge itself was formally ended. But Jesus continues to occupy the temple and to defend his authority to be there until he is ready to live on his own accord. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 and 2. Jesus, however, is not yet done with the chief priests and elders of the people. And it is in this context that Jesus tells the three parts. The parable of the two sons, the parable of the vineyard and the tenants, and the parable of the wedding feast. Each of these parables is told to the Jewish religious leaders 
and each of the parables illustrates the rejection of Jesus. And each of these parables pronounces a judgment on Israel for their rejection of the Messiah. Our parable of the two sons invokes a tradition that reaches way back into the past. The pattern of the two sons runs through the entire Old Testament through to the New Testament. Beginning with Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4 verses 2 to 25. It continues down through Ishmael and, and Isaac. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 21. To Esau and Jacob in Genesis 25, verses 29 to 34. Only to be reflected once more in a modified form in the behavior of the 11 sons of Jacob, the one chosen. Genesis 35, 23 to 26, 37 verse 2 to 36. And then Moses and Aaron in Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 to 17. The history of the chosen people of Israel and indeed the history of the Christian people is governed by a remarkable pattern of pairs of brothers and sisters. And it remains an unresolved question in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In an hour of God's dealings in history, Jesus took up this pattern again in the parable of the two sons. He gives it a new accent. It is about relationships between sinners and the righteous, between the Gentiles and the Jews, and that is the issue. In the Gospel of Luke, we read the parable of the rich man and the poor Lazarus. Luke chapter 16, verses 13 to 31. Equally, is the story of Mary and Martha, the two sisters of Lazarus. In Luke chapter 12, verses 38 to 42. These are models of contemplative and active apostolates of our own lives. Once again, the Gospel of Matthew re-echoes the pairs, the brothers Andrew and Peter, as well as James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. Jesus presents the parable of the two sons to the religious leaders of Israel for the purpose of exposing their blatant disobedience. Jesus basically calls them out for not, for not backing up their religiosity with true obedience. Jesus not only exposes the failures of the religious leaders, he also flips the script and shows us how Israel's most unexpected and most despised people have done better than the religious leaders. This tradition of pairs, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is laden with the images of envy and betrayal, struggle for power, and sometimes reconciliation. Here, however, in our gospel passage, the goal is ultimately an appeal to say yes once more to God who calls us. Jesus is therefore not asking his adversaries to comment on random fictitious brothers, but to locate themselves within the drama of self-righteousness. This parable, together with the two that follow, 
forms a trio of parables voicing God's judgment against Israel, especially high religious leaders and the elders of Israel for their rejection of Jesus. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us revert to our gospel passage for our reflection. Jesus said to the chief priests and elders of the people, What is your opinion? A man had two sons. He came to the face and said, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. He said in reply, I will not. But afterwards, changed his mind and went. The man came to the other son and gave the same order. He said in reply, Yes, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did his father's will? They answered the first. He shall say to them, Amen. I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. When John came to you in the way of righteousness, you did not believe him, but tax collectors and prostitutes did. Yet, even when you saw that, you did not let her change your minds and believe. Matthew 21, verses 28 to 32. The parable of the two sons is so succinct and straightforward. Jesus asked a second question, but what do you think? The religious leaders dodged the first question about John's authority in Matthew 21, verse 25. But now, they cannot dodge this thought. The point which is so obvious. What do you think? A man had two sons. This parable outlines two responses to God's call. The first son says, I will not. But changes his mind and does what is needed. The second son says, I will go, but does not. Both sons are guilty of violating the commandment, honor your father and your mother. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. However, which son sinned more grievously? The distinction between the two sons turns on action versus word. Jesus and his adversaries agree that only one son does the will of the father. The son who says no, but goes nonetheless into the vineyard to work. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, actions speak louder than words. And Jesus uses this exchange to expose what the leaders really thought about John. The chief priests and elders' failure to believe and respond to, John's, to John reveals the truth about where they stood. And thus, which brother they actually represent? Jesus' authority, in contrast, is affirmed by the integrity of his words and actions as well as his uh, as well as by its own outcomes gathering and restoring healing and cleansing releasing from demonic powers restoring sight table fellowship with sinners and preservation of the least ones all are examples of the fruit of repentance.
Matthew chapter 21, verses 31 to 32, makes it clear that the tax collectors and prostitutes are the first sons ultimately obeyed. And the chief priests and elders are the second son ultimately disobedient. When John the Baptist called people to repent, tax collectors and prostitutes repented and were baptized. It was easy for them to repent because their sins were obvious even to themselves. The religious leaders, however, were aloof to admit their need for repentance and rejected John's call. They also rejected Jesus. In Matthew 21, verse 30, the second son says, I will go, sir, but does not go. We are reminded of Jesus' words earlier in the gospel. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. And the other one says, this is in Christ, obedience is a problem for God's people in every time and space. The ancient temptations of immorality, the ancient temptations of power, the ancient temptations of money are very much alive even today, 2,000 years later. Temptations can be overwhelming. And before we realize that, these temptations would have entrenched their hooks in us. And any attempt to dislodge them can be very painful. However, that is our calling, not to succumb to temptation. When we set out to save God, we can be sure of the fact that the tempter who amasses troops to try to divert our attention from our godly task. Trials come our way in an array of ways, but mostly in the areas of provision, the prominence of God, and what consists true worship of God. Provisions, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, would include things like food, security, shelter, housing, clothing, relationships, acceptance, etc. All that we are and have come from God. Therefore, we ought to give prominence and preference to God himself and his word. And the rest will be added unto us. Priority and prominence of God in our lives to seek God first above all other things. And in this regard, God's will may mean going against the tide, the common notion, giving God his right position in our life. God will not allow us to be tested more than what we can bear. Worship of the true God. Here we are faced with the challenge of power, the challenge of authority, the challenge of money. Most often than not, God has to keep us in the wilderness until all our golden calves become detestable despicable and shameful to us. The golden calves we are doing in our everyday life, such as fashions, job opportunities, houses, success, fame, fortune, etc. 
It is often because of such things that we often must face the wilderness. The church equally is also a subject of temptation just as individuals. The church can also be tempted to become more appealing by softening its doctrine. The church may also be tempted by calling people to fellowship and repentance or to rely on music to entertain worshipers than the life-changing word of God. It is so amazing, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, how easy it is to lose track of Jesus' call to go and preach and baptize, especially when we start worrying about paying the bills and keeping the church afloat and buoyant. But which of the two sons did the will of the father? The priests and uh, the priests and elders answered the first. That is only partially correct, of course. The father's will was that his son would say yes and fulfill it. And neither son did that. But the first son who initially said no, eventually changed his mind and did what the father had called him to do. He was therefore more obedient than the second, who initially said yes, but then failed to follow through. Hesitant faithfulness trumps unfaithfulness. When the priest and elder said the first, they condemn themselves because they are like the second son in the parable who said yes but failed to follow through. And their disobedience was rooted in part on good intentions. They had become so intent on analyzing God's law that they had made a snarl of it. But their disobedience was rooted in larger measure in the spiritual pride that made it impossible for them to recognize that they too were sinners, that they too needed to repent, that they had much in common with the sinners whom they despised. We might think of Jesus' parable as a picture that reveals different understandings depending on where we stand in proximity to it. When we stand very close in Jesus' shoes, the first son is the tax collectors and prostitutes, and the second son the Jewish religious leaders. When we pull back several decades to, Jesus, to Matthew's perspective, the first son has become the Gentile or the church, the second son has become the Jew or Israel. When we pull further to our day, we see that the first son, the faithful son, has still yet another face. Perhaps a recovering alcoholic, members of a small Christian community, a church that reaches out to the needy in his community, a priest who calls on his parishioners to true repentance. A church member who decides to give back what belongs to God. Or a young person who decides to remain abstinent until marriage, however reluctantly or painfully obeying Christ. The second sign is a person in the pew who refuses Christ's entry to the deepest recess of his or her heart. The Christian who refuses to obey Christ in the sensitive areas of his or her relationships, in the area of money, and in the area of power, in the area of relationships. Or a pastor who 
whose sermon is designed to please people rather than God. A church that ignores issues of justice and mercy. And all those who appear to be faithful, but deep down themselves, their faith is skin deep. This parable tells us that belief will be accompanied by changes in lifestyle. The spiritual principle is a self-evidence as physical principles such as the law of gravity. To ignore the force of gravity would put our physical lives at risk. To ignore the connection between belief and faithful discipleship would be to put our spiritual lives at risk. It is in that we will be saved by faithful discipleship rather than faith itself. Instead, Jesus is exposing the truth that faith that does not result in behavioral change is not true faith. The person who says, yes, but does nothing puts himself or herself at peril. The saying, more certainly I tell you, signals the importance of the statement that follows, namely, tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering into the kingdom of God before you. Tax collectors and prostitutes accorded ways for sinners and those outside the power of respectable religion. They are at the opposite end of the spectrum of religiosity and in every other way away from the chief priests and the elders. Therefore, Jesus opens the door widely to the tax collectors and prostitutes because of their acknowledgement of their own sin and their willingness to repent. Hence, they are assured of salvation, entering into heaven first. On the other hand, the religious elite, thinking that they are holy, they find it nearly impossible to face the reality of their own sin. And despite that, Jesus does not slam the door on them. The ways before you hold out the possibility that these self-righteous sinners might be permitted to enter the heavenly gates as well. However, their penalty might be that they will enter last instead of first. Jesus does not promise here, neither does he speak of hellfire and the gnashing of teeth as he does elsewhere. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe. John had called people to repent, to confess, and to be baptized. And the multitudes had responded gladly. He had harsh words for Pharisees and Sadducees who came for baptism, calling them the offsprings of vipers. Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But he nevertheless held the door, he nevertheless held the door open, telling these elites to bring forth fruit worth of repentance. Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. And not to put their trust in the fact that they had Abraham as their father. Matthew chapter 3 verse 9. He knew that their pride would make it difficult for them to acknowledge their need for forgiveness. Their need for repentance. But he left the door open. A crack in the event that any of them would choose to enter in. When you saw it, you didn't even repent after. 
what you might believe. When these religious elites heard John's call to repentance, they failed to repent. They very well, they very well might have felt their hearts tear under their dynamic preaching under his dynamic preaching, but they could not bring themselves to acknowledge that they too needed repentance. Neither son was obedient. Each was disobedient in his own way. Hence, would do well not to emulate either son, but rather to be obedient both in word and deed. Salient points for further reflections. From our previous catechesis on parables, we are able to deduce that some of the parables are designed to convict people in their own sin. In the Old Testament, we saw Nathan convict King David of the seriousness of his sin with Bathsheba by using a parable. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. In the New Testament, Jesus uses some parables to point out evil of his adversaries in a manner they cannot refute. Such parables are a judgment out of their own mouths and an appeal to repent an appeal to change. In the parable of the two sons, Jesus makes the chief priests and the elders of the people convict themselves. From the first words of the parable, Jesus says, but what do you think? Jesus makes them question their own motives, their own thoughts, he wanted them to react to this parable as David did to Nathan's. In the conversation between Jesus and the religious leaders, we learned that these two sons represent different groups of people. One son is independent, disobedient, and insolent. But after a lot of soul searching, he returns to carry out his responsibility. The second is a big mouth, full of oratory, but no action. In these two men, Christ describes on the one hand sinners of all types, who when convicted by John the Baptist and himself, turned away from their iniquities, repented and obeyed God. On the other hand, are the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders, and all other righteous people who feign a zeal for the law but will not receive the gospel. The first son is a demonstration of tax collectors and prostitutes. The second son is an illustration of the chief priests and the elders. However, the pericope shows that the former will enter into the kingdom of heaven before the religious leaders. Sinners were entering while the righteous were left outside. By and large, the parable of the two sons is a story about the source of authority. It is also the story of the heart. From where does our heart speak? The first son refused to obey his father. Something we all do. Something that we have all done. And something we will continue to do. Yet, after a few moments of reflection, his heart, his conscience spoke to him. Especially, about the relationship between himself and his father, the respect and the love that has shaped him, 
and all that the father has done in his life, that thought, that recollection, changed his mind. And he went and did what was required of him. Literally speaking, the young man repented. It is repentance that produces a change of behavior. Biblical repentance is defined as a genuine sorrow of one state of sin. It is the product of a changed mind, a mind that looks at sin as God sees it. And that prompts a change in action. It is an act that makes us make a U-turn from doing wrong to doing right, from being bad to being good. It frees us from our own oppression of sin to the freedom of the children of God. And indeed, from walking in darkness to walking in the wonderful light of God. The first son opened his heart and he changed his mind and followed his inner voice, the voice that calls on each and every one of us to do good and avoid evil. The voice that calls for remorsefulness. This son was like those tax collectors and prostitutes who refused to follow the law, who persisted in living in a state of sin, who had become outcast, but then responded to God's invitation to righteousness, to Jesus' own message of hope and love. Yet those tax collectors and prostitutes had no idea they had a place in the kingdom of heaven. They were simply grateful to be loved, accepted, and included in the kingdom of heaven. The other son, however, gave the correct response, much like the chief priests and the other leaders of the temple, but then failed to leave the law to love God and neighbor. The leaders, that is, they established the hierarchy within the faith, saw themselves as not only insiders, but also were the ones who drew the fence lines of the kingdom of heaven. They saw no need of repentance. As the adage says, familiarity breeds contempt. They were just too familiar with their religious practices and saw nothing beyond the practices they presided over. We may also become too familiar with our office and become blinded with the observance of the rules and regulations and overlook the word that calls on us on issues of justice and mercy within and without. This parable depicts the classic struggles over the essence of faith that is what we say and what we do. Earlier in the verses, preceding our passage of reflection, there was a question from the chief priest about whose authority Jesus had to say and do the things he did. Jesus, in a typical fashion, turned their question and asked them about John and his source of authority. Whichever answer they would have given, it would have resulted them in trouble. If they had said it came from God, then that would have been an admission that both John and Jesus did have legitimacy. However, the answer that John's authority was strictly, however, if they answered that John's authority was strictly human. They risked angering the crowd who, at this moment, 
were in full support of Jesus and his predecessor. They answered, we don't know. It was a deceit, a refusal to take position, to take a stand or to take responsibility. They could not, no not, engage the faith which they profess so ardently. Their faith remains skin deep, just like the sun who so promptly gave us his assent to his father's request to go and work in the vineyard, but would not commit himself with his actions. The second son deceitfully professes respect and obedience, but he never does his duty. The contradiction between his word and his works exposes his major character, namely hypocrisy. It is harder to convince a hypocrite of his true state than a fragrant sinner because in deceiving himself, the hypocrite follows his own standards and his form of godliness. Contrary, the fragrant sinner knows he is evil and is willing to make amends. Many of us profess to know God, but we deny him in our works. We appear very pious at church, but our personal lives are riddled with sin. We live a lie, and out of our smooth mouths, our deceitful hearts speak. Our efforts produce the works of the flesh rather than the fruit of the spirit. However, our ultimate actions reveal the persons that we are. And that makes the whole difference. And that is what makes us go into heaven first or last. It is not about our privileged position in the vineyard, nor is it about the duration of service in the vineyard, but rather complying with the Father's will and doing God's work with the help of the Holy Spirit. Thus, it is better to repent and attain in obedience to God, even if we had disobeyed him. God gives us always a second chance. It is up to you and me. Let us pray. God our Father, give us the courage to cave out time and pace and space to do your will. Calm us down when we are overwhelmed by our own failures. Give us peace when we are troubled by our own indecisions and clear our minds to see your way and your commands and change our hearts by the power of your spirit for the better. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.